Good morning, everyone. My name is Mihai Patru, and I'm the executive director of Caravan's Ride Project. As I mentioned earlier, this is our first meeting in 2022, and we thought it's a great um, start to talk about collecting qualitative data and building narratives. Uh, this webinar is part of a series of two workshops. Uh, in February, we will work with Robert Perez, and his uh, webinar is called Telling a Hardwire Brand Story. Robert is running an organization in San Francisco called Wonder Strategies for Good. Uh, but going back to, the, to our work today, uh, we have the privilege to um, have Professor Anthony Jerry uh, from University of California, Riverside, talk about strategies uh, around collective collecting qualitative data, but you also using this information in building uh, narratives. A uh, bit about our work at Caravan's Rye Project. This <clears throat> webinar is part of a year long series. Each uh, month we meet with our networks or everyone who's interested in mission driven work and tackle a topic that we've learned it's of interest to our network. Um, this series are supported by uh, Wells Fargo uh, as part of their uh, Open for Business Fund. As we like to mention every time we start a webinar, these are suggestions that are based on our general experience in nonprofit management and the public information that we currently have, as well as our uh, as our guests. Um, a bit about Dr. Anthony Jerry, as I mentioned, he's an assistant professor of anthropology at University of California, Riverside. He's also the, fund, the founder of Cultural Media Archive. And the way we connected with him and we know more about his work is that he joined our SITLAB cohort 2021-2022 uh, uh, to work on his um, Cultural Media Archive an initiative that I would like him to talk a bit about before jumping into his workshop. And thank you everyone for joining us. The um, recording will be shared with you after the webinar. Uh, as well, you can, all the previous webinars are available on our website if you are uh, interested and in, uh, to go back and see some of our previous work. And just one last thing. Uh, please follow us and subscribe to our newsletter, as in a couple of weeks, we will announce a few opportunities for seed investments that are dedicated to uh, startup ventures, especially ventures that are um, focusing on mission driven work. Thank you again for joining us and Anthony, you have uh, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Mihai, for for your, your introduction and, and and thank you to Car Caravan Sarai for inviting me today to, to the webinar. Um, as Mihai mentioned, I'm, I'm the director of a small nonprofit called the Cultural Media Archive. Um, and I would say that in, in, a, in, a, in, in a word or a phrase, um, our sort of reason for being is to create uh, vehicles uh, for youth voices. Um, and, and much of this then is about creating digital platforms um, to present youth voices and youth experiences um, to the public and then to create education uh, tools or to use those narratives to, to create education tools for social and emotional learning um, and to help build empathy, um, not only among youth, but I think among the broader um, you know, US population. Um, so, so my training then is, it, my academic training is, is in research qualitative research and qualitative research design and analysis. And so with the project that I'm doing with the nonprofit, I'm using some of that and thinking about how we can use qualitative uh, data to, to really get a sense of what it is that young people experience, uh, uh, particularly with certain themes that I'm working on, um, on, on, on this project, what I'm calling the youth citizenship narrative. Um, project. So for me, then the, 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 the use of qualitative data, what I'm working with now is trying to figure out how to present raw qualitative data in a way that allows people to 
hear and learn as much as they can about particular experiences. But what I'll talk about today um, is, is a more focused sort of approach, um, I think. And, and while it's just an introduction, I'll leave some time at the, at the end of the, the, the presentation to, to discuss any concerns that you might have or, or, or to, to, to field some questions. Um, but, but today, I think what, what I'd like to focus on is, is first sort of the idea of data what is data rather than simply thinking about information? Um, and then the value of qualitative data. And then after that, um, I'll focus briefly on some strategies for collecting qualitative data or designing uh, uh, a research approach. Um, and then thinking about making sense of that qualitative data um, as far as presenting it right, or as far as packaging it. So, so I think that there's a common bias when we think about data. Um, uh, give me one second, Br Bradley. Can is there a way I could see the uh, see the PowerPoint? Yeah, let me go ahead and start sharing. All right, sorry about that. Thank you. Okay, so I think we could uh, jump to slide two. So, so I think there's a, a common bias when we think about data. The the assumption seems to be that data, in and of itself, refers to quantitative information. Uh, slide three. That is that data is about proving through quantification, right? Now this in turn supports the intuition in our contemporary technologically focused world that numerical data is not only objective, but is the only way to accurately tell the story. Now we often refer to this type of data as hard data and therefore we associate this data with a set of irrefutable facts, right? The idea that the numbers don't lie. And because of this association with objective numbers and facts, numerical data is perceived to naturally prove the existence of some phenomenon or another. Now, I think that the naturalness that we have created around numerical data allows us to rely on quantitative data more than we should when thinking about how to tell the story. The focus on quantitative data has allowed data to become valuable unto itself. Now, this can be seen by the often recited and I think overused statement that data is the new oil. Right, and I think this focus on data is is is, is, is on quantitative data is so sort of ingrained into what we do. Right, when I was building the PowerPoint, for example, um, all of the suggestions that Microsoft Word uh, offered me, right, when when building the PowerPoint, when the, when when the program read the word data, were all numerical representations. Right, it was all about graphs and charts and numbers and. And, and mathematical equations and stuff like that, right? And I think that's sort of a representation of, of how our intuitions around data have, have, have become all about the hard data, right? The quantitative data. Now, many of you have experienced this valuation of data firsthand. I'm sure that you've been invited or even in some cases required to tell the story with more numbers to make your reports and organizational suggestions appear to be more authoritative. The assumption here is that if people experience a certain phenomenon and the issue must, if if, if more people experience a certain phenomenon, then the issue must be worth addressing, right? That is that the more that something is experienced, the more important it is, right? Or that if a product or service is actually being consumed or utilized by a large population or community, then the product or service itself is actually hitting the mark and having the desired impact. In short, we're allowed to believe that the numbers speak for themselves. But how can we be confident in the fact that we know what we think we know? Uh, slide four. I think the other issue here um, is, is oftentimes a, a power issue. I think that oftentimes organizations um, are in a position to provide resources based on their own capacities. And so rather than thinking about what it is that the populations that they're interested in serving uh, actually need, right? They design something based on their own capacities and then put it out into the world. And when communities are in a situation to have to use a service, Right, this creates a sort of a power dynamic where you don't necessarily need right to reach out to the communities you serve because they're in a position to have to use those services right and so what they have to do then is figure out how to put those services. Uh, insert those services into their own lives, rather than really going out and, and finding services that are designed right for the needs that they have, and so I think the qualitative data can help us take a different approach to that as well right so I think that. The issue of how do we know what we think we know is an important question. And I think that this is where qualitative data can help add a level of understanding and richness to the story that our quantitative data attempts to tell. 
Now, I'm not arguing here simply for a privileging of qualitative data, because I think that numbers can be important. What I'm suggesting is that there, there, there's, there's a balance that we can find, right? And the qualitative data can really be useful in supporting right, the quantitative data, but can also be useful in, in interrogating what it is that we think that we already know that we're actually trying to quantify as a way of demonstrating something. Now, I think this can be true for both internal, right, that is considering issues within the organization, and an external focus that is on products, services, and how outsiders experience the organization. However, I think before we can accept the qualitative data and the time and effort involved in the process of collecting qualitative data is not only useful, but a necessary part of the process of telling the story, I think we need to ask another simple question. Right? That is, what is data? So we've become accustomed to accepting the idea that data is simply information. Now, in what has been referred to as our current information society, information has been seen to be a source of power. But where does the power associated with information come from? The real power of information can be found in the ability to put that information to work. And this then is when information begins to transform from being simply knowledge about a particular subject or thing and into a more useful and focused type of information that is data. Now, this is to say that data is systematic. Data is put to work to answer a certain question or to address a certain issue. Right? And I think that this is a, an important understanding in thinking about how it is that we can use qualitative information right, as data rather than simply relying on qualitative information as sort of anecdotal right, to tell sort of the experiences of indi individuals. So, so what is qualitative data? So recently I spoke with someone who explained to me that narratives are easily dismissible, right? I'm working on a project with someone and, and they said that they needed someone to, to work on the data. They need a, a data journalist because they said that, that, that anecdotes, right? Qualitative information are, are easily dismissible as people's experiences can be easily questioned and perceived as not being representative of a larger population. Now, I think that this is really a data issue and not an issue specific to qualitative data. However, because numbers have attained a certain authority in our information society, they're rarely seen as anecdotal. Qualitative data, data, on the other hand, is often accused of being anecdotal, and in some cases, qualitative even becomes a synonym for the anecdote. Now, the issue of data authority can be addressed by focusing on the research design and the use of individual narratives to develop grander narratives that reflect the experiences and feelings of a larger number of people. Now, we'll focus more on the elements of actual research design aspect a little later. The point I'm trying to make here is that qualitative data is not anecdotal. Qualitative data and the qualitative research process is systematic. And qualitative data helps answer the question that quantitative data and, quanti and quantitative data analysis str often struggle to address. Now, stated simply, qualitative data helps us understand the why and the how questions around what it is that we want to know. Now, while quantitative data addresses the what question, qualitative data can help to address the human factor, the why and the how, in a way that may not be possible with quantitative data. This is because qualitative data is largely about context, context and helps us understand how this context changes people's experiences around the actual what question, right? Now, this is an important thing to recognize uh, here that quantitative data can also be anecdotal. Right. The issue here is not about the inherent authority with a certain type of data, right? The numbers versus the, the narratives, right? The difference between hard data and soft data, um, as is commonly discussed. The issue is really about research design, how we collect this data, and how can we go about an analysis of the data when crafting narratives and telling a story. Now, I promise I'll get to the research design aspects a little later, but here I just want to make it clear that quantitative data can also be anecdotal. Now, this is especially the case when sample sizes are too small to make an actual useful statement about anything or experience. The other issue is that qualitative data collection often takes longer to collect and analyze the quantitative uh, and analyze than quantitative data does. Now, many times people in organizations do not allow for enough time to actually collect and analyze qualitative data. This is one of the key factors in perceiving qualitative data as anecdotal. Without the proper time to collect and analyze qualitative data, this data simply exists on the level of individual narratives. Therefore, a narrative is often used anecdotally to support the claims of particular numeric data points. And I think the other issue here is that numeric data is oftentimes readily available, right? So folks can, can say, oh, we need some numbers here to shed light on the issue, right? So they can reach out to some organization and, 
and, and quickly grab the numbers. Whereas qualitative research takes some sort of, uh, it, it takes planning. Right? It takes an understanding of how it is that qualitative research is going to is going to be worked into the process, right? And then allowing time to do that kind of work, collecting the narratives, doing the analysis, uh, 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 and then creating a broader narrative or argument, right? Therefore, narrative is often used anecdotally to support the claims of particular numeric data points. Now, I'm sure you've seen many examples of this, and why, and and may have been. I may have even used this strategy yourself. Now, this strategy is useful for creating an element of humanity around the numbers, but I think we should be mindful about how this strategy reinforces the numbers rather than gives us a real sense of how and why people do what they do or feel the ways that they feel about our products and services. On the other hand, numbers are oftentimes readily available due to the fact that our society has relied on certain institutions to collect numerical data for centuries now. Now, the point here is that qualitative data can seem more difficult to, let, to collect, and therefore the benefits of this data, I think, can be overlooked by organizations. Now, qualitative data can also feel messy, and therefore figuring out how to utilize and make sense of this data can turn people off. For example, I'm working on a project now uh, in which we're collecting narratives about the Black experience in the Inland Empire for the Civil Rights Institute Inland Southern California. They're, they're, they're called the CRI. So the CRI wants to present these narratives as part of a story map. Now, because placing say 30 to 50 narratives on a story map, right, the issue is presentation in a way that is easily digestible can be problematic. Now, some, some got a little anxious, right, in the early part of the project, and they wanna fall back on the anecdotal use of narratives to present the information more efficiently, right? The, the question is, how is it that you present 30 individual or 50 individual narratives, right? In, in a way that people then can, can make sense of these narratives. And I think that, that right there is, the, is, is sort of the, the key to taking the wrong approach, right? So the issue here is not about the qualitative data itself, but the lack of familiarity with using qualitative information as data. Now, I know I keep saying this, but I'll get back to the practical issues of dealing with qualitative data a little later. And I'll address that issue of how it is that we take the, the many, right, the, these large number of narratives and then distill those down to one broader narrative in a way that then allows that information to really become data. But first, I want to elaborate on how qualitative data can help. So how does qualitative data help, right? Since much of the data that we seek to collect uh, deals with human interaction in the social setting, the why and the how questions can give us a greater understanding of the story that the quantitative data attempts to tell. Qualitative data also allows us to question what we think it is uh, we already know by testing these assumptions with the communities we are attempting to reach. So qualitative data allows us not only to explore why it is that others are doing what they are doing, but it allows us to look inwards to really question our own assumptions and our own understandings about what it is that we think we know. So I'll, I'll give you an example here. I worked on a project uh, in 2020 and 2021, uh, no, maybe 2019 and 2020, um, with, with the, the state of California um, uh, uh, on the census project for reaching out to, to black communities. Now, we, we were contracted uh, by the state of California or, or the group that I was working with was contracted by the state of California to reach out to what the state of California labeled as hard to reach communities, right? Now, these hard to reach communities were communities of people for some reason or other were, were seen as, as difficult to reach by the census and therefore uh, were regularly undercounted um, in the census, right? These communities included uh, homeless folks, they included immigrants, um, they included veterans, they included um, any number of, of folks, but specifically for our purposes, the, the, the state of California said that uh, Black folks, so Black communities, right, were hard to reach. Now, with, with, with the idea of being hard to reach, right, um, I think first you have, to, you have to ask yourself, right, why are communities hard to reach? So the question, for example, of why immigrant communities might be hard to reach could be an issue of language, right? We were working with a, uh, not working with, but sort of side by side with a group um, that was addressing that question. What they were doing was trans, uh, translating all of the census information 
into different languages, right? Which then meant that they could actually reach out to these uh, immigrant communities. Um, homeless people or, or, or folks that were housing insecure were hard to reach because they actually didn't have an address, right? And the question was, how, how were they going to fill out the census? How could that information uh, get to them? But the, 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 the assumptions around why it was that Black communities were hard to reach, I think were, were really sort of under analyzed, under theorized, right? So what we had to do then was design a qualitative research approach that really allowed us to go out and talk to Black communities to really find out why it is that Black communities were hard to reach. And what we found then is that there were variations in why these different Black communities were actually hard to reach, right? Some of the reasons were distrust, right? Now that seemed to be a theme that uh, was common between the Black communities that we talked to in California, right? Those in the Inland Empire, uh, Sacramento, Oakland, um, the Central Valley, um, Los Angeles, California, or San Diego. Um, but other issues were, 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 were that there, there were variations within the community, right? Some, some communities wanted more information not on how it was that the census services could be used to provide or the census count could be used to provide services, but rather they wanted information on how it was that they as a community could use the information in the census to then have some sort of impact on their communities, right? There was a whole number of assumptions, I think, that allowed for the state to take its sort of traditional approach to, 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 to these black communities. So what we did is we used the power of qualitative data to really understand, right, some of those assumptions and to test and to question those assumptions. And then to come up with a strategy that really allowed for our materials, right, that were designed to reach Black community to really hit some of the themes and some of the issues that Black communities had told us, right, that made them a hard to count uh, population. Okay, so who can or should collect and analyze qualitative research in your organization? Now, the short answer to the question of who can collect and analyze qualitative data is, is an easy one, right? I think it's, it's anyone. However, the question of who should collect and analyze qualitative data is a little more complicated. Now, on one level, everyone, individual or organization, every uh, individual or organization, right, who needs data can benefit from collecting and analyzing qualitative data. As mentioned above, this type of data allows for a richer picture of the issue and can be useful to add context to quantitative data. But once an individual or organization is committed to the qualitative data process, who within the organization should engage in the collection and analysis of qualitative data? Now, without getting into a philosophical debate um, about objectivity, right? I think it's important to recognize how close someone is to the project and what their actual incentives are for collecting qualitative data. Now, the point here is that we want to be careful not to set out to reinforce what it is we already think we know. Another issue is that people are oftentimes committed and very attached to the work that they have produced within an organization. And this then makes it difficult for them to hear, right? What it is that other people are saying because they've already convinced themselves through the labor, through the work that they've done, right? That they're on the right track. Now this commitment can apply to services, products, internal reports, or any number of things that result from our daily work within an organization or with communities, right? Now our commitment and attachment to the work that we produce can put us too close to the, to the issue and can limit our ability to take seriously what it is that others think about our work or even how others directly experience our work. Now this can be an even bigger problem when we think about the time constraints that organizations often face when engaged in a project, right? And so I, I imagine that all of you have been in the experience in, in, in the situation where you've, you've put hours and hours and hours in on a project and now you find that you've got to make some changes, right? And, and, and the deadline is, is getting closer and closer and closer. And now making changes to that, uh, to that project or the information, the products or the services that you've developed, right? Seems like a, a waste of energy and resources and all those kinds of things, right? Now, this can be even, sorry about that. And again, since qualitative data collection requires time, we want to be aware of the issue of potential setbacks, as well as the time it takes to incorporate the results of qualitative data analysis into the final product. So I'll give you another example uh, from the census project here that I just mentioned earlier. 
right? In the early phase of the project, one team member told me they no longer wanted to be a part of the qualitative data collection process. We went out and we did some interviews and, and we were talking about the process on the way back. We did some interviews and focus groups and they said, you know what, this, is, this just isn't for me. I don't, I, don't, I don't wanna do this anymore. And so they told me that they were gonna let me then go into the, into the quote unquote field and, and continue the work on my own. Now, ultimately I convinced them not to, to, to do that. But um, the, the problem was that the person from the creative team was so attached to their work, they could not accept how people experienced the work that they produced, right? So what we did is we were developing um, radio spots and short commercials, videos, and those kinds of things to really promote the census and to, to reach out to Black folks and tell them about the, the benefits of the census and all of the, the ways in which the census might be used in, in their own lives. And so we, we, we created this material based on our first round of, of qualitative uh, research, interviews, and focus groups. And then we took this information back to those same communities and asked them if we had hit the mark. Right? We asked them, have we heard you, and do you see your voices and opinions, your experiences reflected in the information? Now, this meant that, that so, so, so while, we were, we were, while we were presenting this, these, this information during the focus groups, right, it turned out that the actual content creator right, was attempting to explain the work to the group, right, in effect dismissing what it was that the focus group said or felt about the product. So they were telling us, hey, you know what? That, that doesn't really work for us. And in some cases they, would, they told us something. And when we presented what they told them back to us, they realized that what they were thinking wasn't exactly what they felt, which meant that we were gonna have to go back and make some changes uh, to the information that we were presenting, right? Now this led the person um, to explain to the, to, the, to the focus group participants Right, simply you're you're reading it wrong, right? And so what the what what the content creator tried to do was explain to the participants how they should be reading the information, right? Now this issue was made worse by the fact that the content creator felt that they were a, a member of the target population, right? Because they were part of the black community, right? And because they were so close, right, to the issue, because they were so committed and tied to the work that they had already done, they had a hard time hearing what it was that the community was telling them about the work that they had created. Now, now this, puts, this puts people in a tricky situation, right? Because the question is, do you go back and make some adjustments, right? Or do you simply try to find a way to run with whatever product or service that you've already created and then find another way to try to make that hit the mark, right? Now, eventually through the focus groups, we learned that racial identification was only one factor for determining how the target audience experienced the material. And addressing this one factor for some, for, for some of these communities in California seemed inauthentic, right? It seemed like the focus was too much on them as Black people rather than them as people, right? And so what we had to do was go back and actually make some adjustments and focus more on these other issues, right? The other ways in which they experienced this information rather than simply reaching out to them as Black folks. The target population was not only Black, but they also fell into a number of other social categories housing insecure, system affected, formerly incarcerated, lower income, upper income, college educated, high school dropout, religious, et cetera. Now, this was also an issue that the census overlooked in their initial conceptualization of the project and the idea of a quote unquote black community. It turned out that there were multiple black communities in California. And our strategy then had to address this idea of a diverse set of black communities rather than simply going after one monolithic black community, right? Now the numbers don't tell you that, right? The ways in which we do counts in California and we focus on race don't really tell you about the context in which people experience being black and how that experience is also based on other demographic factors, right? So the qualitative data really helped us to understand that, make that argument to the census. And once we did that, then we got the go ahead to really start to, to get a little more creative with the content and the way that we were trying to address these Black communities to bring about uh, 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 more census participation. Now, the tendency then seems to be to privilege the social experience of race, at least in this, in this example, over other experiences, right? However, our team pushed the census to question what it was that they thought they knew in the first place. Now, this allowed us to consider other factors in the process and ask deeper questions about how other social categories determined their experience as Black communities. 
Now, again, the numbers told us that Black people were a hard to count population, but the narratives allowed us to get a real sense of why and how this had changed, this, this changed according to region, right? Uh, uh, issues of history and, and all of these other kinds of things that we paid attention to. So using qualitative data then to help understand quantitative data. Now, as I've already mentioned, uh, qualitative data can be an important resource for making sense of quantitative data. In some cases, the quantitative data that you are working with may already exist. In this case, you can design a qualitative approach after the fact. That is, you can think about what the quantitative data was designed to look at, the questions or intuitions informing the collection of the, the numbers in the first place. Now, once you have understood this information, you can design a qualitative strategy that asks some of these same questions, or you can even test the validity of the questions being asked by the quantitative design, right? That is that you can go back and ask people how they feel, right, about some of these issues. And, and you don't have to do that in a direct way to say, hey, do you believe this? Do you believe that? But what you can do is you can design your qualitative approach, right, in a way that either tries to confirm or, uh, I don't want to say confirm or deny, but either confirm or to sort of disprove right, or complicate what it is that the qualitative data has already assumed. Now, I think that this is a good strategy for really asking whether the questions apply to a particular subject or target audience in the first place. Now, asking these questions and then posing a set of research questions to a target audience can help shed light on, a certain, on certain assumptions that might not apply to a target group, or at least to help get a better understanding of why a set of assumptions apply or not. Now, again, in the census example uh, that I just mentioned in, in our work on the project, the first assumption was that Black people were hard to count. Now, the numbers around this are easy to figure out, right? You simply say, okay, how many Black people do we think are in the state of California, right, or, or in the country in general? And then ask yourself how many people actually participated in the last count, right? And there's other ways to get uh, uh, the numbers around black communities rather than simply going back to the last census, right? So you can then compare these, right? And now you say, okay, well, it turns out that we're only getting a certain percentage of participation in the census among black communities, right? However, the, the, the why question about being hard to count is much more difficult and cannot be teased out of those numbers. So I can tell you that black people aren't participating in the census or at least weren't uh, participating in the census. My, my understanding is that this last census um, was, a, was a higher count than they had, they had gotten um, before with regards to the Black population, right? So I can tell you that about the numbers, right? However, the question about why, right, or about, about being hard to count is much more difficult, right, and cannot be teased out of, out of the numbers. Now, this leaves the data analysis team with the difficult task of trying to come up with the, the ways of making sense of the data that might not apply to the actual target population, right? Now, the issue here is that you might have to fall back on speculation, right? And so I, I can give you an example. So the team said, okay, well, well, black folks are hard to count. And before we even started the project, we had to simply speculate, right, on why this might be in, in order to start the question or to start the process, right? But I think it's dangerous to rely on this speculation, right, based on our understanding of ourselves, right, as parts or, 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 or connected to the black community and then say that our speculations then actually represent black communities, right? And then what we do is we turn those speculations into fact, right? And, and that can be probla problematic, right? So this in turn required more testing of the, the hypothesis and all of these kinds of things created around the quantitative data, right? So in the case of the census project, we recognize the numbers of black people that supposedly failed to fill out the census However, we wanted to know why black people fell into this uh, hard to count category. And again, this required that we did some real qualitative research. Right? Now, in other cases, qualitative data may not, or quantitative data may not exist. Now, this is especially true in cases where you've decided to question the assumptions or other pre-existing quantitative data sources. Or this may simply reflect the fact that the data you need is more specialized and people are not asking the questions that you wanna know the answers to. So in this case, a qualitative strategy can be designed in a way that allows for numerical data to be teased out of the qualitative responses. Now, this allows you to start sorry, with rich 
qualitative data that sheds light on the why and how questions, and then transform this data into quantitative data that, you can, that can support your claims and future strategies. The point here is that qualitative data can be used to offer much more than anecdotal narratives that support pre-existing quantitative data. Now I want to move into a little more practical uh, uh, approach to qualitative data and focus uh, just a little bit on, on qualitative uh, strategies and design. So I think the, the, the first question is sort of, is the issue of asking the right questions, right? Now asking the right questions, I think is an important issue. Defining what questions are the right questions really depends on what it is that you wanna know. Now, I think that this issue of what we want to know is key and can be a difficult thing to address. For example, an organization may want to know what services a target population needs, but is this really the question they want to know? Right? I think that the real question behind this is what needs people are trying to address through the services that they utilize. Now, understanding this deeper question could be the key to not only developing the services, but could have major implications for the ways in which the service is offered and then utilized by the target population. Now, this might be the difference between people being able to incorporate a service in a way that enhances their lives due to the, due to the compatibility of one service with another already utilized service, or on the other hand, it could be the difference between the target population having to sacrifice some other benefit in order to take advantage of another service that is for some reason not compatible with other pre-existing services or strategies. Thinking about context, I think is another important issue. The key here is to think about the environment which something is happening or experienced. The question is how do we learn as much as we can about the why and how questions from our target audience? The strategy here would be to allow for the main points to emerge through conversation with members of the target group, right? That is that you're allowing them to tell you rather than you telling them and then asking them to comment on, on what, you've, what you've told them. Now, this might be within, this might be within a one-on-one -on -one setting with specific representatives of a target group, or you might be able to conduct focus groups or group interviews that allow for you to get a sense of the context in which issues are experienced and services and products are used by members of the target population. Oftentimes, you'll want to use all of these strategies in order to compare the difference between individual and collective voices. Now, these strategies will allow you to gain some insight into the context in which particular issues are experienced or in which services or products are utilized. Now, there's another issue, uh, issues of experience, right? And, 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 and that's in some ways diversity, right? Which can be a key issue here. And I won't spend too much time on this, but I think it's, it's worth addressing just a little bit. Now, the issue of diversity can create some tricky issues for qualitative data research. The issue of trust can be one such issue. Now, often people will trust someone from within the community. Utilizing someone who somehow has a connection to the community can be a useful strategy for gaining trust within the community. Now, gaining the trust and respect from the target community will often allow for trust in the actual qualitative data, right, that comes out. However, this connection to the research community can also allow the target community and researchers inadvertently rely on shared intuitions, right? Now, this can be a problem during the actual data analysis phase, right? When you go back to your data and you're thinking about how is it that I make sense of the data, and you realize that rather than rich, qualitative, uh, ethnographic narratives, right? What you rather have uh, is a bunch of uh -huhs and you know what I mean, right? Rather than reliable narrative material that can be compared to other individual and group narratives. And I've been a part of a lot of projects where we talk to people and we're asking questions and, and in the moment, right? We're all sort of vibing with each other. We're, 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 we're understanding and, and communicating around the questions. And then I go back and I listen to the narratives and it turns out we weren't really saying much. Right? We were feeling a lot, but we weren't saying much because we were relying so much on our intuitions and our understandings, our shared understanding of a particular issue that we really didn't collect much information on how the person actually felt to be able then to compare that information to other folks. And so I think it's dangerous sometimes to rely too much right, on this insider connection to a community because what it does is it allows you to, to operate on the level of intuition but doesn't push you to interrogate the things that you think you already know, 
And someone from outside the community, right, who doesn't share those intuitions might have to ask more questions to get the respondent to really explain what it is that they're saying, right? And I think there's some real value there. But I think the key then is thinking about how it is that you can build respect, right? Whether you're an insider or an outsider, right, of the, uh, in the context of the community, and then use that respect then to really collect some powerful information. Now, another issue is the simple respect for diversity in the data collection process. Now, example here might be relying on someone who's a native speaker of the language spoken by the target population, um, if possible, to collect qualitative data rather than an interpreter, right? So, so, so the issue is here is how do you really show or demonstrate your respect for the community? Right, in a way then that establishes that bond or that, that, that potential for trust between the researcher and the community in a way then that allows you to really get some of, the, uh, of this information. Right? So I think the point here is to take the target population seriously as collaborators right, in the data collection process, not simply as the target right, of the actual research process. Again, however, I, I would take, I, I would, I would caution against taking this too far, right? Because taking this whole process too far, right, can, can make us appear as ingenuine, right? And so again, I think the, the census project that I worked on is a good example, right? The, the folks from the census tried to reach out to black communities and demonstrate that they were interested, right? In, in collecting census information from black communities because they really felt that these communities were vulnerable and that they felt that the census data could somehow impact these communities. But the black communities were, were suspicious, right? Because they said, well, if you haven't cared about us before, right? you don't care about us nine years right? out, of, out of the decade. And now in year 10, you say, hey, we want all of your information, right? How is it that that translates to the sort of years of invisibility, right? That they feel that, that, that they've experienced. So I think there has to be a balance there, right? I think that the, the, the way to approach that balance is really thinking about the community that you're working with and the group of people that you're talking to as collaborators in the actual process. Okay, so now we'll focus just a little bit on strategies for asking. Right? Now, a more practical issue here with regards to asking the right questions is being aware of the assumptions that inform a question. Now we wanna be sure to ask questions that are not reliant on our pre-existing assumptions about a particular target group and start from the real desire to know more about the experiences of the target group itself. That is, we want to assume that the target group are experts in their own needs and lives and ask questions that allow us to really benefit from their expertise. Secondly, we want to be sure to ask open-ended questions that allow us to leave as much room as possible uh, for the target population and allow them to offer the information that we may not have thought to be relevant, right? So we wanna build in some spaces that allow them to tell us, right? What we're missing or what we didn't even know we needed to know. Now, this is also true when designing surveys. Surveys can be a powerful tool for collecting qualitative data. However, the surveys must be designed in a way that makes the most out of the opportunity and allows members of the target population to speak for themselves. Right? And I think this is the problem with some of those quantitative surveys, because they give you a set of choices that you have to figure out how your experience fits into. Right? The qualitative research design and the qualitative survey can allow you to get the information directly from the respondent. They can tell you exactly how they feel. Now, the, the issue here is then that you have to go back and figure out how to analyze this information and put it into categories that make sense in order to make it comparable with other uh, information, right? What I'm saying here is that you actually have to then figure out a strategy to turn that individual information into data, right? That then allows you to say something about a collective experience. And then be sure to ask respondents to elaborate on things that seem to be intuitive, right? Remember that you're trying to get as much information and contextual understanding as possible. You may think you understand what they mean, but it's, important, but it's important to be sure. So be sure to take the opportunity to ask follow-up questions and even ask the same questions in different ways. Also be sure to follow up on things that you may find surprising. Now, in some cases you can follow up with people at a later date to get clarification or more information. However, in most cases, this will be your only opportunity 
Now, I, I work with a lot of students on, on my projects. And so for the Youth Citizenship Narrative Project uh, that I mentioned earlier with the Cultural Media Archive, um, I, I'm giving students in some of my classes the opportunity to learn qualitative research methods by actually collecting uh, interviews and reaching out to people and participating in this project. And what we're doing in the project is we're collecting narratives on four different themes, right? We're collecting narratives on experiences of being a first generation citizen. We're collecting narratives on experiences of coming out. We're ex collecting narratives on experiences of police brutality. And we're collecting narratives on the first time hearing the N word. Now, in, in, in my understanding, right, a, a comparison of these narratives right, against each other says something about the ways in which young people experience citizenship right, in the United States uh, specifically. But I think it also allows for a rich data set on each one of these individual narratives, right? And it allows for, for young people to listen to these narratives and then to recognize that other people have had these experiences as well and, that other, and, and to understand and feel how it is that other people have dealt with these experiences and how those experiences have informed the lives of others. Now, I've tried to make it clear to my students, right, that, 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 that the goal here is to really get folks to elaborate on their experience, to really allow the listener, right, whether they've experienced the topic or the, the, the issue or not, to, to allow the listener to really feel, right, what, what, it, what it's like to experience some of these different, different issues. However, some of my students are, are, are so, they're so focused on collecting the data, right, that they forget to take their time and ask the people to elaborate and really explore, right? What it is that these folks are saying. So what I'm saying is sometimes they forget to have a conversation. They run through the interview questions and they say, okay, that was great. And now they've done the exercise, they've collected the narrative, right? They've, they've collected the information. But what they forget is that the goal is not simply to collect the information, right? The focus is not on the interview. The focus is actually learning as much as we can about the theme. And so I have to go back and tell them, hey, you know what, you missed so many opportunities, right, to really get them to elaborate. And because we're doing this in an anonymous way, there's no way that we can go back and get this information, right? And sometimes people will give you their contact information, but they'll be busy. Um, they may have been embarrassed about something they said or a number of different things and, and getting them back, right, to, to elaborate on what it was that they've already told you right, is, is hard to do. And so I guess what I'm saying is really make the most of the opportunity and really make sure that the focus is on exploring, right, the, the questions that you're asking rather than simply going, through the, simply going through the process of conducting an interview, right? Um, and then be sure to design questions in a systematic way. Now, this does not mean that you have to have a formal interview script or that each question has to be asked in the exact same way or in the same order to each respondent or focus group. What I really, I really try to make the conversation as natural as possible rather than creating a formal interview atmosphere. And I think what this does is it allows for people to become comfortable. It allows for them to lead the conversation and it allows them to tell me what's important rather than me telling them what's important and then trying to sort of, you know, pull the heat up to get them to tell me more and more information about what I think I need to know, right? Now, the key here is to make sure that the questions address a certain theme overall, right? Now, this way you can be sure to address the theme with the respondent, even if you ask a different version of that question, okay? Now, later during the analysis phase, you'll be able to then arrange the responses according to those themes, right? So you won't simply say, okay, well, I asked this question, how did they respond to that question? What you'll start to look for is how it is that you can really get some information about each one of these themes. And sometimes the theme or the information from the theme will come out in another question because the respondent actually experiences it in a way that you didn't anticipate or you didn't know, right? And it's interesting, I'll give you an example with, with the, the, the youth, citizenship project that we're working on, right? I, I saw police brutality and the N-word, right, as two separate experiences. It turns out that some folks experience the N-word for the first time within their experience of police brutality, right? And so allowing people then the space to tell me these kinds of things and then to focus, right, um, then allows you to really get some things that you might not have seen. And I'm, I'm paying attention to the chat a little bit um, and, and something just popped up in me, the idea that compassion 
um, is bias in and of itself. And I, and I, I mean, I, th I think we can say that, you know, all of us are biased in some, well, why don't we get back to that in, in the, in the, in the Q and A part? Cause I think that's an important thing to address. Um, and, and I'm almost wrapped up here. So I, I, I was just intrigued by that question. Sorry to, sorry to get sidetracked there. So lastly, I think you should pay attention to how your respondents are responding to your actual questions. Now you may be asking the wrong questions, right? And if this is the case, be sure to adjust your questions based on your respondents' feedback, right? Take them seriously, right? Recognize that, okay, maybe I didn't know what I think I needed to know. And maybe I need to reevaluate the set of questions that I'm asking in order to fit the context, right? In which these, uh, the group of people that I'm working with are actually experiencing this particular thing. And I think this applies to products and services, right? It turns out that sometimes products are being used in a way you never anticipated, right? Um, now, now, the other thing here is that asking the wrong questions can also be a strategy for collecting information, right? But you have to be sure that your strategy is an intended, is, is, is the intended strategy, right? Don't just sort of haphazardly utilize that strategy and, and then say, okay, well, maybe we can salvage these kinds of things at the end. And I'll give an example here. When, with the Youth Citizenship Narrative Project, I've been working, uh, you know, we're asking folks about their, their coming out experience, right? And so what we ask them is to, to you know, it's an open-ended question. It's a, it's, a, it's a prompt, really. And, and we simply say, hey, give us your experience or let us know your experience on coming out. The, 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 the respondents have told us time and time again, right, that you're asking the wrong question. And we say, well, what do you mean? And they say, well, it's not about coming out one time. Right? They say the reality is, is that you're always coming out, depending upon the context, depending upon who it is you're talking to, right? depending upon what it is, that, that, that how it is that someone else is incorporating you into your life. Right? But asking the wrong question in this case allows the respondent to clarify, right? and then it allows them to really explain the process. So I think asking the wrong question here is, is a, is a is a good strategy to start the conversation because then it allows the respondent to tell us what they feel and how they experience this particular thing, right? And we've gotten some really rich data, rich information um, by asking this wrong question, right? And so we've kept that question in there intentionally as a way to, to get the conversation going and to get people to really elaborate and explain uh, their experiences. Okay, I'll, I'll uh, uh, quickly wrap up here. Okay, so the last thing I want to talk about then is making sense of qualitative data. Now, because we're talking about qualitative material as data, you'll have to take some time to analyze your qualitative material. Now, during this process, the intention should be to look for some kind of pattern that emerges across the data. Better said, we're looking for ways to connect the individual narratives in a way that allows us to say something broader. Now, this is one way in which we move away from the anecdote and the individual experience and allow for our data to say something meaningful about the experiences of the target group and our overall focus. One way to approach this process is to pay attention to the themes that emerge in the individual narrative process. For example, while collecting data for the census project mentioned earlier, several themes began to emerge when trying to understand the overall reason that Black communities seem to resist census participation and therefore ended up in the actual hard to count category. Now, one of these reasons was distrust. So this, same, so this became a theme that allowed us to make broader statements about census participation among Black communities in California. Another theme that emerged was that Black communities wanted to understand the ways that census data could be used from within the community, rather than just how an accurate count could be used to deliver benefits to the community, right? And there were individuals that said a lot of important things about these particular themes, but what we did is we realized that overall, this is something that communities were frustrated with, right? Narratives again and again and again addressed these two themes among others, right? So the goal for us then, or the, the, the task for us then, was to figure out how it is to bring all of those individual narratives together Right, to tell a collective story or a broader, broader story about issues of distrust or issues of wanting to be able to use the data from within. The other issue is that the other, the other issue is that system, you need to systematize, right? Um, the, the idiosyncratic or the anecdotal. Now, each one of these themes seem to be addressed by the individual narratives and focus groups, 
The key for our team was to recognize potential themes that emerge from the individual narratives and then try and recognize if and how these themes continue to emerge within other narratives as we continue the project, right? So the reality was, is there was a number of different themes that came out and there was some interesting stuff that individuals would say, right? But if these themes didn't continue to emerge in the other interviews or the other focus group sessions, right, then we had to assume, right, that at least in the, in the, in the, in the context of our research project, right, that those themes were anecdotal, that they were individual, right? And we spent more time then on the themes that continued to emerge, the collective, right? Now, if a theme was not addressed by multiple narratives, as I said, we, would, we could still recognize the theme as an important issue. However, we considered the information around these themes as more anecdotal and focused our efforts on those themes that were commonly addressed by multiple narratives, both with individuals and the focus groups that we convened. And then there was the issue of seeing the numbers, right? So another key to the analysis phase is to recognize how these themes can be transformed into quantitative data. So it's important to keep record of the things that you can actually quantify. For example, how many people are being interviewed? Uh, how many people respond positively or negatively to a certain issue? What demographic categories are represented by your respondents or focus group uh, participants and, and, and things like that, right? So you'll wanna pay attention to the things that are actually quantifiable because then what you can do is as your themes are emerging and as you're doing the analysis, you can actually put some numbers next to those things and then make some statements about right, how it is that this information um, uh, or how you can demonstrate, right, these strategies that you're coming up with or, or the arguments that you're making with the actual numbers as well. Now, once your themes begin to emerge from the qualitative data, you can use these themes to build surveys, these themes to build surveys that allow you to test whether larger numbers of people have similar experiences or share the opinions of your interviewees or focus group participants. Now, this strategy can allow you to track your experiences and opinions uh, as, they, as they change over time. All right, so building the narrative from many voices uh, to one story. Now, the last phase of the analysis process is to build the larger narrative. Now, this is really about organizing your themes and finding a way to create one voice for many. This process requires that you, you distill the narrative information into one broader narrative that captures the key points addressed by your respondents. Within this process, it helps to use some individual voices as examples in order to elaborate on the actual theme. For example, you might state the theme and let the reader know how people in general responded or felt about the theme. Then draw on one or two specific narratives in order to really point to specific examples, right? And so now you're not using these individual narratives as anecdotes, right? Or you are, but they're actually supporting a broader theme, a broader narrative, right? Uh, uh, about a particular experience, right? And so now you, you've moved past the individual and you're thinking about telling that collective story, right? Now this allows for you to use powerful anecdotes to support the data you have collected rather than relying solely on the anecdotal information to create an emotional response. And I think that's the sort of, I think that that's one of the issues, right? In the ways in which people use uh, qualitative information, right? They sacrifice the potential of the qualitative data to really say something meaningful and they use the individual narratives to really, uh, uh, to, 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 to elicit some sort of emotional response. And I think that's also the part that folks take issue with, right? Because it, it creates suspicion, right, among some folks. And, it, and, and it, it then allows for people to distrust and say, I'm going to dismiss that, right? Because I don't necessarily feel that way. And it doesn't invoke the actual emotion that you were, you were going for, right? Or evoking the emotion then simply makes people suspicious. And then the issue of putting qualitative data to work, telling the story. Now, I think that oftentimes those who will be interested in qualitative data will not have the time to work through all of the information. In other cases, they'll not, they'll, they'll not have the, the training or the patience to be able to extract the broader story from many individual narratives or interviews. Now, the work here is for us to be able to use this information to present the story in a way that allows the reader or person in the position to provide oversight or make some kind of determination to understand the story. Now, this can be a tricky process, right? For example, with the, the, the census process that I was working on since I was an academic, um, since I am an academic, right? Um, my first report to them was something like 35 pages of in-depth analysis. 
as I assume that the state wanted to get a clear picture of the process and what black communities were saying. Now the state did in fact, right, want a clear picture. However, they wanted a snapshot. And rather than deal with the minute details that made up the whole story, um, so, 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 so rather than, than, than that sort of detailed picture, right, they wanted a snapshot, right? So partly the issue here I think is about trust. And so what you have to do is package this information in a way that then allows for you to create some authority, right? Without simply relying on all of the information. And I think, again, this is about presenting the themes. This is about talking about why it is that you're presenting these themes and why it is that you're using this particular approach. Now, telling the story in a way that established authority is important in gaining that trust. And I think that this is one of the issues with anecdotal information. Most people will view the anecdotal information as important, but it can be easily dismissed as individual and therefore does not establish authority. Now for some, this authority will still be about seeing the numbers, right? And, and I think you can get that information from the qualitative data if you're thinking about it from the very beginning. Now, in this case, it'll be even more important to translate that qualitative data into a quantitative representation. The last issue I have is just something I, I want to bring up, right? Because it's something I'm thinking about. It's something that I'm applying for grants to do. And it's something that I think more and more uh, organizations are, are trying to support, right? So another question is, how can we let the qualitative data and the stories that we collect speak for themselves? Now, for many of us, the point of collecting data will be to support some immediate process. This might include drafting a project report for a funder or collecting data for the development of some service or product. However, I think that qualitative data can be used for much more than this. Now, a focused strategy of collecting qualitative data can create the possibility of making that which was silent audible, right? That is, the power of narrative is not simply in collecting, but in creating a space for the narratives to be heard. Now, all the issues with collecting qualitative data that we have addressed today still apply in this other process, right? The key here, though, is to think about the platforms for getting this data to the ears of those who care. In the context of change, I think that this could be the key to really unlocking the power of qualitative data. And, and if you have the capacity, I think, with your organization or your group, I, I would explore you to, to really think more about that, right? But I think that maybe that's probably uh, better for another, another workshop. So I'd, I'd like to thank you for your time and, and, and open it up to any questions that folks may have.